August 5, 1962, Princess Margaret finally pulled down the Union Jet after more than 300 years of British rule in Jamaica. The soundtrack to this newfound freedom was the first truly Jamaican music, the newly invented ska. Because the time has come when we can have some fun, so take a run. You know, it was just a simple song and the people them jumped to it and, you know, going around. And then, whoa, 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 we're independent and, uh, you know, flash the man and uh, it was great. That was something to see and never can come back in Dominica. We're in the Independence came at that time when Scare wasn't in speak. Yes. And so it was just jubilation all around. You understand? You know, with the, with the acceptance that we were now a free country and Scare in its peak. And, and everyone just went, went crazy for it. You couldn't go to a party before 62 to play Scar. After that night, you, you had to play Scar for the party to be successful. It was unbelievable. Everyone gravitated to it. This was something new, and I noticed something too. They had pride. They, when they looked at it, they said, this is ours. It would have been nice to say, well, independence caused people to want their own music, but the music preceded independence. But it was a wonderful coincidence, because independence gave it further drive. The music came first. The story of modern Jamaican music starts in the early 1950s, in the poorer areas of downtown Kingston, with the emergence of a uniquely Jamaican phenomenon, still at the heart of the music 50 years later, the sound system. The sound system is essentially a street discotheque, with speakers big enough to raise a family in. It's where poor Jamaicans have been coming to dance till they drop, ever since they stopped listening to jazz bands in the now ruined clubs all over the island. You had sound system before recording. You have the, first it started, the Jamaica music started off with orchestra dance. But when the sound system came in, they replaced the musician because people used to hire these bands to play, but the musician used to stop and eat a lot of porridge, so it, it, it burn up a lot of time and thing, you know. The band would go in intermission, and intermission forever. So the people had to get fed up of this no dance within the dance. So in the intermission, they made a mistake. They agreed that the first sound system should play in the intermission. That was the end of them. I never turned back. It was all about rhythm and blues. As the 1950s rolled on, the music of Fats Domino, Ray Charles and Louis Jordan was streaming into the island from Southern American radio stations just over 90 miles away. And with the sound systems blasting it out most nights of the week, downtown Kingston went dance crazy. And like any craze, it was rich with opportunity. People used to make money from it. You sell your own beer and you sell your own curry goat and rice. And you got the sounding system from 8 o'clock to like 6 in the morning and they eating and dancing in the street. You get like two, three thousand people and you make a buck. Sound systems became the biggest local industry in downtown Kingston and competition was fierce. To pull in the punters, you had to have the best music blasting out of your system. The race was on for the hottest American tunes. He's the Ricky sensation. You know, American people, they need cheap labor, so they bring with cotton cane and things. But why are they cotton cane? If you buy rhythm and blues, six times more money you get because you're going to sell it back to sound system people. So everybody anxious to go to the farmer, but not for cotton cane. They want to go buy some record. <laughs> you know? Out of this fierce competition, two giants emerged, Clement Coxon Dodd and Arthur Duke Reed. 
Combining their liquor businesses with their sound system dances, they were effectively the barons of downtown Kingston and would continue to control the Jamaican music business for the next 15 years. They could run the country those days because people, had, where anywhere they sound string up, you have the crowd of people there before. They used to play in, in competition. It come in now like um, Joe Fraser and Holly. Joe Fraser is the man who go on this dance and go to the gate and him get everybody out of the gate money for coming on and dance, you know? And the people they believe all the cocks and dance and come on the Joe Creed. Sometimes them just take the money and go to the cocks and dance just to see him, you know what I mean? So it's like that. So. All of them used to be at war, you know? Oh, the sound system thing was. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a traditional thing. You can't stop it. It has to come from way back, you know? Come on. Yes, suddenly rum is served to sophisticates because suddenly Jamaican rum has regained its place among the great drinks of the world. You read out a rum there where it don't sell no stores. If you think rum is strong, you ask about rude to your parents. When you show what, they know what happened it, yes. Show chasing it, waiting up. Smoke. The smoke, vapors thing, right? And that is what the bread of my drink, like they have cocaine now, that was for them cocaine. So after you give them two drink a root to your parents and send them go to and dance, that dance done. People are jump fence to get out the fast, fast. <laughs> Ukraine had a program on the radio, I think, 4.30 on a Saturday afternoon called Treasure Isle Time. They would advertise the liquor business, and then he would, on those programs, they would play newly made Jamaican records. They decided to drink some more, but when I look at the clock, it was quarter to four. To promote their sound systems, Reed and his competitors had turned to record producing by the end of the 50s, but not as we know it today. They had no intention of selling records to anyone else. They brought jazz musicians down from the tourist hotels to play Jamaican versions of American R&B, and then they just made one copy of each record to play on their sound system and achieve the much prized exclusive. We start imitating the rhythm and blues songs like say Smiley Lewis or Professor Longyear or Louis Jordan and you know those kind of beat we tried to imitate it it didn't turn out that way so we decided to keep this as our own type that's how that can come in Styling like those was really rhythm and blues. What we did to this rhythm and blues is like you'll be doing one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. But the, the, the scanner we change it to one, two, three. And then it's more two, four, two, four, instead of one. Jamaica first musical revolution. And we call it Skia. And then Skia was a dirty word. But what it was, it was um, terribly influenced by Jamaican activities of the people, you know. Culture Jamaica was pushed into it. And when the people took it on that fast, right, they just grabbed to it because it was them. This is the way of life of the lower class people. We haven't got anything else. What else do we have? I mean, the middle class or the upper class can uh, buy a ticket and go to Miami or somewhere like that. 
That's all you have. You don't know anything else. You would not find the creative force that comes out of the inner city in the residential areas in Jamaica because they are more settled into a pattern, into a tradition. Well, there's a social divide and a cultural divide. We live in two countries. When Ska was popular downtown, it had no popularity uptown. In 1960, much of uptown Jamaica still preferred American music, and many of the jazz musicians who had invented Ska were making a living playing the tourist resorts of the North Coast. So have a serious type of class prejudice in those days, let's call it that way, <laughs> you know. And it would have hurt my career in a certain sense. You couldn't go up, uptown and play ska music, so it was really like a, an outlaw type of music, you know. In 1960, Prince Buster started his own sound system. To steal a march on his rivals, he approached the ultimate outcasts of Jamaican society, the Rastafarians, who since the 30s had looked to Africa rather than Europe as a model. He persuaded Count Ozzy and his master drummers down from the Warwick Hills into a recording studio. At in those days, if you say he's a Rasta, ah, they have news black for you now. And when I make Carolina, that the really Rasta, whole Rasta speak. Because now, them, it was not a music world, them could play upon sound system. And if you play upon sound system on the island, everybody go and hear you. 